I think that's a major mistake uh, of often, certainly, of those who want ideological change. And now, as people have said, times of transition, like Habermas talks about, the interstates, the society opens up fissures in the status quo, and it is a time for intellectual resistance. It is a time for opportunity. So I suppose what I'm saying is the mind is a site of political struggle. And one thing I've learned working with various people, including community groups, people I don't agree with often, we work with a lot of groups who are not seen as left. For example, the Irish Deaf Society, with 24 people at the moment who are completely deaf working with us uh, and, and to develop activism. But one I see is working with that community, for example, their mind map, their cognitive map, is so radically different to what the left in Ireland would think as left politics. It is literally in another world. So what I'm saying is, to bring about political and in change, we have to change the cognitive map most of us have in our head. And I think that is a real, a very big political project. Religious institutions have always known that. That's why they want to control schools. They've always known it. <coughs> you control the cognitive frame, the cognitive map. So I certainly think there is like Boltanski and Chiappella say, the capitalism has incorporated and reinvented criticisms against it. Well, I would argue that, of course, there can be counter resistance and that you can actually engage in the very, I'm not going to go through it here, but let's say Thompson's theory of ideology. I think it's so relevant for people who are involved in political change. You need to look at legitimation and how it's done. Uh, you know, tests of strength. I mean, the powerful in society constantly put out their narrative and they <coughs> give the impression that it is being tested. For example, the ideology of meritocracy. That you are, if you work hard and you're academically able, you will get on, you will get a job, and of course that we have the best people always employed and they get the best jobs. Now, we know that's not true. We know from research and education that's not true. But we have increasingly tests of Strength. So what have we got lately? We have got the HPAT. We have got the introduction of the MSAP, Mature Student Admission Pathway, Health Professional Aptitude Tests, more tests that actually give the impression of legitimating selection. So the leaving cert is no longer, but of course what they are, are new tests to discriminate. The HPAT, particularly on gender grounds, I can tell you definitively, from your university here, if you look at the graduate entry, it is over 60% men. If you look at undergraduate entry in the higher education sectors in medicine, I know we will not be given the data because they don't want to disclose it, but I do know the UCD data, that it is over 60% men now, when it was 66-7% women. It has worked. They have created new discriminations. Mature student um, survey is supposed to be non-discriminatory. I'm sorry. We know that when they definitively exclude older working class people from mature entry because it's an online test and there's a whole series of questions. Again, no information, no data, but these are legitimation exercises. And so what I'm saying is, if we want resistance, we want to bring about change, we have to study how the right is actually controlling and how it is reinventing itself and legitimating itself. And of course you have dissimulation as, as, um, uh, as um, Thompson talks about, where you deny that there is any problem. You deny, of course, this is not, it's just normal practice. So you normalize the injustice, and you say, and it is very visible in education, you say, this is just the way it is. These are intelligent people, the whole ideology of it, IQ and intelligence, which is another great 19th century eugenicist myth. And of course, you create uh, images of internal unity, and that is where the left is definitively seen to be you know, not at the races. Because it simply doesn't have and doesn't create that. But what it happens, of course, is the opposite, fragmentation. So you have the major attack by the right on the public sector unions. And that in itself creates its own dissensions, its own tensions, and of course it fragments those who want to resist uh, neoliberalism and other ideology. And you have the reification, the Tina mentality. Whereas, you know, we have argued for the tar mentality. There are real alternatives, but I'm only saying that is how it works. So I think if we're involved in resistance and involved in change, we have to look at the techne of ideology. 
And we have to work in a very systematic way with those systems of unification, uh, avoiding <coughs> fragmentation, and creating very real alternatives to the, the, the neoliberal definition of there is no alternative, so to create a new form of uh, a new ideology. And that's why I agree with Gramsci. Ideology is not just an analytical category, it is a normative category. It is about creating other ideas, other senses of uh, other cognitive maps in society. And if we look at what we have, and this is so powerful now, uh, the market view of the citizen. It is ubiquitous almost in this country. Uh, uh, the market, you know, as Fraser said, the market was to take politics. The market is a primary producer of cultural logic and cultural value. It is Hobbesian in character. It assumes that people are um, privatized citizens, responsible for themselves, and relations between people will be mediated by the market. <coughs> And I think it's epitomized in the iPhone, the iPad, the I mentality. Right. Uh, everything is I, and you find its expression there. And even those who are anti neoliberal don't often see, and this is the success that Boltansky and Chiapella refer to, of neoliberal capitalism, is that it has become reinvented and we have become incorporated, even those who actually think they're resistant. We know what it is. We, we know, even take the press of expression, we know it's about reducing the cost of capital of public services, etc. But you can take the expression the nanny state, which I have heard people of the left use, the nanny, which is sexist and ageist. And of course, that ideology feeds into a public consciousness that you have the state is a nuisance, the state is regulating the rights of state. So I think there are numerous examples of how neoliberalism has taken hold, alighting the differences in the university between public interest and commercial interest. I think this is one of the most serious things. It is almost impossible to get a debate on it. But we know that there, for example, that Wellcome Trust um, and many of the major um, commercial firms in the, in the pharmaceutical industry are publishing, are funding research in the sciences. And this elision between public interest and, and, um, and private interest is almost, it's almost completely there. There's nobody even debates it anymore in the university. And if you question it, you are seen to be a troglodyte. Somebody, again, you are delegitimated. You are seen to be somebody who is making out uh, that there is an issue of domination when in fact there is no issue. And I think we have to go back, I mentioned here the Bay Dole Act in the United States in particular, because, of course, we have had the privatizing of intellectual property. Um, and a key dimension of neoliberalism was the growth of knowledge-based industries and businesses. So that you have this irony. I find it so astounding that the state of the taxpayer, everybody is a taxpayer, but the people of the country fund the universities. They fund new enterprises. They subsidize them. People get patents. And then their first goal is to make money fast. They have been funded by the exchequer. And what do they do? They privatize the interest. It is extraordinary. It is truly extraordinary that this is not called into question. And it is that level of seepage that I'm talking about. It is everywhere. It is seeped right into the very heart of what should be scholarly dissent. Uh, and it's almost impossible to get a debate about it. We have these others, I suppose, the very obvious ideologies, the illusion of freedom. Of course, no one is freedom without resources. But, uh, you know, the rights are redundant, that everybody's free to choose. But also, I know uh, people like um, <coughs> Ulrich Beck and others talk about the risk mentality. But I also think what's very significant politically that people don't talk about is the culture of fear. Because you have a massive rise in the security industry. The other day on the radio, I heard, for example, the people from, I don't know what country, I think it was in Donegal, actually. And they were talking about how the state was cutting back some of the money for alarms for old people and locks in their doors. And I thought, how extraordinary. The security industry has made people so fearful that they believe they're going to be robbed when they're, in fact, the least likely in the country to be robbed. Because most robbery is among poor communities by poorer people within other or related communities. But the culture of fear is very powerful because, of course, it facilitates 
the neoliberal state. It facilitates it because people fear that the other, whoever the other is, it can be the stranger from you know, the working class estate where people are employed down the road, and all the language that's used to describe people who are different, or it can be the immigrant, the foreigners. But it is always somebody, and there is a fear. And part of that fear is, of course, to actually generate a sense of, of dissent from kind of, of people. So we have new justificatory regimes. I believe still, for example, uh, the meritocratic myth is so powerful. It's everywhere. Fairness, testing, examining. We know the tests are fair. The research by Bourdieu and France has shown that to be the case. Uh, we know that in English language-based examinations, that in fact it is highly class-biased. The, the amount of the vocabulary somebody has, uh, the way in which we assess people is entirely based often in linguistic subjects in particular where it favours those who are linguistically privileged. But we, we go on, we, we talk as if it, it, it is real. And even those of us who are within the academy are often very much part of it. So I think in that sense there is a very deep secret at a very deep level of consciousness. And it justifies everything, this choice ideology of your freedom, of course, that you can uh, casualize pensions, why would you? You can build up your own pension. You can build up your own security. Like Bowman talked about the liquid self, the person who is constantly mobile, who doesn't belong anywhere. They're constantly moving. But that person, of course, has to be a prudential and actuarial self in neoliberal capitalism and have a CV because you won't sell. <coughs> so I think in that sense, there is, in all these ideologies, you know, of autonomy, flexibility, they legitimate worker selection and codes for class privilege. So I'm just saying, I, we have many people who pervade this. We have institutions of the state, we have academics, and of course we have consultants, you know, who from academic life. This is a new role that nobody talks about for academics. Uh, the extent to which, like uh, Giddens in the author of The Third Way, you know, sometimes people may be less known academically. But they use the university. We've seen it with uh, the man who wrote the McCarthy report. I'm not against him personally. But I mean, the association with the university gives him power. The fact he was most of his life a private consultant is not seen. So you have the use of the university where we justify uh, you know, neoliberal politics, neoliberal ideology. And the job is given an academic to veer, to a uh, veneer, to what is already a predefined, as I said, political goal. So I feel that the ideology it, it also is at another deeper level. It's in institutions, it's in organizations, apart from being in our psyche and how we think. Um, reorganization of power and control is presented as a technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, you know, multiple choice tests. This is a very interesting phenomenon. Massive increase in the use of multiple choice tests in higher education. Oh, we can't manage the student body, somebody said to me at the day at a meeting from the economics department. Well, I said for 10 years of my life, I corrected 300 to 500 scripts every June. Nobody did seem to think there was a problem, but you did that. But now, no, we have to have, some, but what about that? What does the technique do? Well, of course, we know from people who know education, as my background in research and my first job was in testing, that those types of tests generally only test uh, comprehension, knowledge comprehension, and sometimes a bit of application. They don't test critical thinking, they don't test analytical thinking at the advanced level or evaluative thinking. But it's a technical solution to a technical problem. So we will have nobody with a critical thought because nobody is ever asked to write one. And people are not asked. Even in the universities, we have stopped thinking, is what I'm saying. As we, I know there's a serious problem of resources. Don't try to, I mean, know myself, I can print 100 essays at Christmas plus tutorial books and whatever. But I'm just saying that there is a problem. But our solution to it is to ignore the cognitive processes that are involved and the implications of those politically, uh, especially in, in producing a critical and alternative consciousness. So I'm saying here, the operation of the pragmatic focus conceives the difference. They, you know, we have to do this. We have no money, the university says. Of course, we have to have funding, for example, from, uh, what's the name of the big drinks company that took over uh, Guinness's? Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, in UCD, Geary Institute has had a big project, I think it still has it, on alcohol behavior funded by Diageo. 
you have to ask. Is that going to be really independent? But if you question it, you are given a pragmatic and operational answer. But that is the solution. So I'm saying that if it produces <coughs> consent and dissent, and dissent is closed down, and I just want to give you some practical examples. These are the institutions that have been closed down. The Equality Authority, uh, the Women's Health Council, the Crisis Pregnancy Agency, many of them are women specific. The Human Rights Commission budget cut and merged with the Equality Authority, Equality for Women measure, uh, transferred out of the area and put under the Department of Enterprise. The National Consultative Committee on Racism closed in 2009. The Gender Equality Desk in Equality and Law Reform closed in 2009. The Gender Equality Unit in the Department of Education. The Higher Education Equality Unit closed and merged into the HEA. The National Women's Council of Ireland had its budget cut by 38% this year. Uh, the Rape Crisis Network is lost, uh, core uh, HAC fund, uh, funding was taken from it in 2009. Women's refuges and the common property. So the closing down of dissent is what I'm saying taking place in the academy. As we go on with our uncritical thinking in relation to how we fund research, how we assess students, because the bottom line is if we assess students simply by asking them to you know, tick a few boxes, we will get a tick box mentality when we're finished. And we are doing it more politically in a very overt way as well. So that, I think, is a big, big challenge. And what I suppose I said at the beginning is, I think we have to fight ideology at the level of, of which it operates, at all those levels of simulation, legitimation, you know, alternatives, uh, avoiding um, reification, creating new concepts and new ideas. But I think we have another problem in Ireland, and that is charity as ideology. I, I, the reason I wrote this, made this put here, is because I am, uh, there is a huge rise in begging. Nobody talks about begging as an issue. There is a huge rise in begging in Ireland. And I was at home, I'm from Clare, a few weeks ago. And there are very nice people who lived down the road from my mother, and they asked me in for a cup of tea. So I went in for a cup of tea, and they are really nice people, and very good neighbours. And the conversation proceeded to discuss the cutbacks and loan fairness. Came up, I didn't raise it, they raised it. And they, it was a diatribe against loan fair developments. Mm -hmm. right. Went back to West Clare, met somebody else I knew back there, and they started off on the travellers. They were a nuisance, they were parked on the road, they were going to rob them, etc. So I'm saying the ideology of charity, I would argue, is the Irish ideology of justice. I would be nice to the people who are relevant to me in my own neighbourhood. That constitutes justice. Okay? And then they're good neighbours. You have institutionalised and class charity. In the Paul, Throker, you name it. We have an abundance. And the NGOs, <coughs> experts on the disabled, rehab, <coughs> professional careers built, while intellectually disabled people have got a pittance to live on. And we have, you could go everywhere, you could go into wherever you like, I suppose the other one that really galls me is every Christmas in the supermarket and shops near where I live, we have the Rotary Club with a basket to collect for the poor. Very, not saying the people, you can't blame people for doing this, nor am I blaming them. But nobody sees the absolute utter contradiction between what are supposedly their very good values and concern for humanity, and only having a trolley to collect food for people that they probably often don't want, that it's given that other people you know, can afford to throw away and not even notice. And nobody questions this in Ireland. Nobody questions the mode of justice that we have as charity. And just look at them. Focus Ireland. So you can take up the challenge of your life and walk Kilimanjaro. Very nice. You have the money to go to Kilimanjaro, that's grand. Concerns website, seven euros a month you can save a child, right? And of course, you have the emotions. You have the feel good factor. You give money on the street, you feel less guilty than if you pass them by. Uh, donators to the charity of your choice, right? So people have no problem in Ireland. 
But if you say to somebody, well, actually, you know, the travellers wouldn't, or somebody else wouldn't need a donation if you actually built a proper institution or we didn't jump the queue in hospitals, etc. I glaze over. People go somewhere else. You have the more leave <coughs> in the sun, I call whereby people are now in the universities, we have overseas volunteers. They're going off for the summer to be a nuisance in some country. And they are going to put it on their CV and they are going to tell you when they come back that they have made a major contribution to development. I am not being facetious because I have a number of students, PhD students, who are from Ghana and Tanzania and a variety of countries and they are utterly cynical. Utterly cynical. And you have the assuaging of your guilt. Because that's very another important emotion because you've done something. You've made a contribution. I'm not saying people here. But I'm only saying that is how Ireland organizes justice. That is what you're asked to do by the Catholic Church and the other churches and the other religious institutions on the whole. And so you get status as well, like Dennis O'Brien opening the Special Olympics. So you have status from doing. So what I'm here saying, I suppose, is I think charity is a huge ideology in Ireland. It's an unnamed ideology. It emotionally makes people feel very comfortable. And it's something that is not remotely about justice or the left or a challenge to austerity or anything. But it is what is offered in the art of justice. This is from UCD, actually. Volunteers overseas, they went to uh, Delhi. Just think how much it costs to go to death. I'd say no more, never mind the environmental impact. So I'm saying ideology exists as well as practice. And here we see it in practice, charity in practice. And it's in, institutionalized in everything in the design of our schools, be it the magnums, the prisons, or student self-fabrication, academic self-fabrication. Academics are always counting themselves up and down now. You constantly engage in this actuarial exercise of yourself. And so does everybody else. And that's part of what becomes you. You, become, you embody your own self-assessment. <coughs> and I think that, that is what's so problematic, because it is so deeply embodied. Not just in the mind as a site of struggle, but it becomes part of your embodied self. And I think that, for example, with the ideology of democracy. I read a, uh, an article by Stuart Hall many years ago it must be 30 years ago, and I ne I've never forgotten it, when, because he said that, of course, democracy was never intended for the masses. <laughs> democracy is an ideology to justify the privileges of the elite. We know that nobody in Ireland agrees with the austerity. We know that people don't agree with paying back annual, all this money that we never owe them, but we have no democratic control. And we see now that there is no democracy. We have it in Greece. We have it in, um, we can see it in, what's the other country where they have no, Italy, Italy. no elected government, it doesn't matter. <coughs> so the charade, I think, and that is something that I think that the, the left and feminists and people of critical persuasion should actually take up, because that is certainly a charade to me at the moment. And what I would actually challenge the left on is, this, um, and this is, I haven't this form later, because I think this must be a quarter to five that I was writing <laughs> that most of the theories of justice that come from the left come from the marxist Bavarian trilogy, mostly the Marxist, obviously, but they're focused on class status and power. And they largely ignore the autonomy of the affective sphere, the care sphere of life, and uh, the sociological and political reality of human interdependency. Yet, I would argue that uh, not just in our intimate life, as in our partners and our children, but in our geographical communities, in our work colleagues, in our nation states, in our regions, there are also overlapping areas of interdependency and potential collaboration. There is another world that exists outside the world of simple economic and political and status self-interest. And what I'm saying is that are the doxes of the left closer to liber liberalism than is realized? The I've written about this in a lot in relation to education, but the concept of the person in education is based on Cartesian rationalism. The rational and economic view of the person, homo sapiens. The citizen also as a public persona, 
as a performer in the public sphere. So when we talk about justice here today, mostly people focus on economic justice. We often focus on that. We don't even focus on uh, participatory institutions, real democracy, uh, real ownership and control within organizations, within the colleagues with whom we work, within households. We don't really. The focus is mostly on, in the left, on the economic. And that's very, very important. But what I would say is, uh, yes, and neoliberal policies, of course, are aligned with that. And there is an alignment, because they are also only focused on the economy, on the rational economic citizen. And what it has done, I would argue, is merely extended and reconstituted an older liberal careless itself, a careless concept of the citizen, the person, the, the member of society, because a citizen is a dangerous word. Uh, and what I'm saying is, even, even in that sphere, the person and their relationality is ignored. So politics, and this is why I think many women find left politics so alienating because they see in it its disregard for their relationality. They, and so do a lot of men, I might add. Not all, it's not a women's only issue. But people recognize that we are interdependent beings, that we are born vulnerable, we die vulnerable. We will die without care. And that interdependency is in, and could be endemic to our politics and to our relationality. And one of my PhD students, in fact, I see Bill Kelly here, Max Cream, who organized really behind Praxis, the community uh, education group, is doing her PhD on precisely this issue, the failure of the left to take the care world of life seriously, the failure of it to mobilize around that sphere. So what I'm saying, I suppose, is this is the world. And down here, this is the hegemony of the rational economic act. And I don't think that the left and the right are that different. They both only see that world. At the top, this world, it's regarded as incidental. Never mind the fact that all of this will crash. Actually, to the engineer drew this map for me. I never forget it because I didn't really even draw it. I really wanted to draw it in front of the sun. But the sun's for any of us. Whereas this other world, we also live in. We live in worlds of solidarity. We live in worlds where neighborhoods, we live in other worlds. And I'm only saying that the politics of these worlds is often completely <coughs> in the reality of political mobilization. So what I see is going on, I suppose, I see wars going on. I think as Ramsey spoke about, there is a war of position, is a culture war. Uh, you know, feminist groups seek control over ideology. And I suppose what I fear sometimes is, sometimes I fear what I see there at the end, that actually the left has stayed in the same terrain. It has not taken on an awful lot of the issues that are overriding concerns uh, for a lot of people in society, like their demise of their neighborhoods, the fact that they're, you know, they have to commute huge lengths to work, the fact that they have literally no time. These are not seen often as political issues, yet they are often the overriding preoccupations for a lot of people. So I'm asking maybe another question I often have when people say about new social movements, Tom uh, mentioned them a while ago. And I often wonder, are they just a sop? Are we, you know, are, 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 can we be effective? Can we be effective politically and ideologically by working through those movements? Anyway, as I said, that is where I have left it at a quarter to five, five o'clock in the morning. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd like to.